welcome to Life Matters. I'm your host, Brendan O'Connell. Life Matters strives to produce informative shows that are timeless, no matter when the shows are aired throughout the Commonwealth of Massachusetts and beyond. Today's show is different. It's very time sensitive. Why? Because the draconian disregard and reckless actions of politicians on Beacon Hill concomitant with the prodding of the complicit abortion industry. Right now, legislation is moving at lightning speed with virtually no deliberation on a bill before the end of the legislative session on uh, July 31st. One of its goals is to nullify the 9-0 to zero drubbing that Attorney General Martha Coakley suffered at the United States Supreme Court just this past uh, June 26th in the case of McCullen versus Coakley when your free speech had had a momentous victory. I'll explore with today's guest the assertions of this hastily drafted proposed bill and its ramifications on Massachusetts, where about 16,000 babies in the womb were, ki were killed in 2012, right here in the Commonwealth. Well, welcome Bill Carter and C.J. Doyle. Thank you, Brennan. Great to be here, Brennan. Well, C.J., let me ask you first, so what is the proposed <laughs> hastily crafted legislation all about? Well, uh, we should ask Bill, because he, just, he has the, the most recently oh. revised version of it. <laughs> Well, the bill, uh, like all of these bills, the buffer zone bill and, uh, you know, other various uh, um, anti-pro-life bills, if you will, crafted under the guise of public safety, um, is in fact a just a very straightforward attempt to push back, suppress the pro-life message. You know, the uh, abortion basically is founded on uh, a lie, a denial of science, a denial of nature, that the... Uh, child in the womb is in fact a child and they insist that it is something else, uh, some other uh, species of tissue or you know something that is less than human life and therefore is disposable. Mm -hmm. So once you see the world from that prism um, and you regard the uh, taking of that life, the removing and destruction of that life as not a crime, which it used to be, but a uh, basic human right, which is what it's claimed as now, then, of course, those who oppose that are necessarily enemies of human rights. And that's where pro-lifers find themselves now. So uh, whatever they can do to uh, suppress us, to keep the message, uh, you know, what they would ultimately like to do, of course, is silence the message altogether. Um, but absent the ability to do that, um, what they have attempted to do with the, you know, a fair amount of success is to intimidate, uh, marginalize, vilify, um, and, you know, increasingly with the force of law, push back, you know, through buffer zones and other type of legislation, people who have that message. So more and more, there is simply this, um, you know, uh, assent to the, the pro-abortion mantra that, uh, you know, goes as a continual drumbeat through our society, uh, aided very strongly by the media and just about every institution within our culture. Mm -hmm. And how are pro aborts like NARAL and Planned Parenthood trying to sell this legislation to the public? Well, they're trying to sell it, obviously, as a, as a public safety issue and prevent, you know, so-called harassment. Look, they used the original um, John Salvi shooting 20 years ago as a kind of Reichstag fire to, uh, uh, to simply impede, impair, inhibit the civil liberties of their opponents. Uh, the reality is, um, you know, Planned Parenthood and abortion clinic operators have a financial interest in this. They, they, they make money from this. They, 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 they want to uh, isolate uh, women coming into their clinics from any, any influence that might deter them uh, from going through with this, this hideous, gruesome and procedure of abortion. Uh, they have a history of demonizing pro-lifers, and uh, they have a very utilitarian view of uh, when it comes to telling the truth. So what they did is, again, they used this um, the, the Salvi shooting years ago uh, to insist on the original buffer zone legislation. Now, this is a manifest absurdity. H how can a painted line in, its, in a street, or in the case of the original buffer zone, an invisible line in the street, deter you know, a mentally unstable gunman bent on homicide, or at least in the case of an abortion clinic, additional homicides? Uh, so th this was th this was always a fraud right from the get-go. So this is really now the third buffer zone bill in Massachusetts. We had the one going back to 1999. Then they found that unworkable, the so-called floating buffer zone. Now they, they went in 2007 to the 35-foot fixed line. And now we're replacing basically a permanent mandatory 35-foot buffer zone with a uh, temporary discretionary 25-foot buffer zone, the discretion being exercised by a single police officer who can decide. Now, uh, we, a bill just informs us now with the revision in the bill, it used to be a group, it was a group as small as two people, now a single individual can be ordered away by the police uh, for 
well, uh, quote unquote, substantially impeding access. But entirely, it's entirely in the discretion of a, of a police officer. So there's no guarantee here against uh, arbitrary and capricious behavior. It's it, it's entirely punitive. The, these draconian penalties. It smacks of retaliation against pro-lifers for having the, uh, uh, the 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 temerity to vindicate their cause before the U.S. Supreme Court. And they and again they're demonizing one entire class of citizens and treating them as threats to public order and enemies of public safety and and uh, and, uh, and and is uh, guilty of intimidation and harassment. And Bill can tell you much better than I can. It's pro-lifers who have been subject to harassment and verbal abuse and uh, even assault over the years. You know, Bill. Let me ask you then. What uh, what is the uh, dispersal clause in the bill, and, and and what are its ramifications? Well, the dispersal clause essentially, uh, when the police have a uh, report of a uh, somebody impeding entrance, you know, what they term substantially impeding entrance, uh, making it very very difficult for somebody to get in by blocking the door or whatever. If somebody does that, then they can. Uh, order that individual or group of individuals to disperse back behind a line which is uh, marked on the street 25 feet from the property. Um, now the question comes in as to how, um, well, how honest they're going to be about and how uh, vigilant they're going to be, how thorough they're going to be in terms of actually determining did that individual blockade the door or was it simply say, an anonymous uh, phone call from some activist. Um, I remember back uh, several years ago when uh, some pro-lifers were over at Planned Parenthood and there was a police detail there. Um, the police got a call. We know this because we uh, obtained the 911 uh, tape as a you know, Freedom of Information uh, request. And we had the, the actual uh, 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 voice you know, that it was exchanged from the dispatcher and the police officer. Dispatcher says, you know, there's trouble down there at 1055 Commonwealth Ave. You know, a couple of the activists are getting out of hand, you know, they're doing their, and, you know, this lurid description of the supposed misdeeds they were carrying out. And the, the officer said, well, look, I'm here. I'm looking at him right now. There's nothing going on. And she said, well, we've got this, we've got this report. We just got just called in. You know, it's, it's getting out of hand. You know, they're out of control. Um, so you get these kind of reports that, you know, come in periodically and a police may show up and say, you know, we heard you were doing this and this. Well, no, we didn't. Um, so are they going to just take somebody's word for it anonymously or are they going to have, you know, only act if they see you blocking the door or if they have, you know, videotape from the clinic to look at, you know, to actually determine if somebody really did go to the door. Um, so I don't know how capricious the police are going to be. Um, they have not been, you know, uh, really uh, capricious or anything with, as far as the buffer zone goes, you know. They haven't tried to nickel and dime us. So hopefully they'll have some uh, standards as far as enforcing it. But there's, you know, vagaries in this law here. And, you know, just the whole thrust of the law and its timing and everything about it just smacks of spite and vindictiveness. By the pro-abortionists. Absolutely, yeah. And they're willing accomplices in the, in the legislature. I shouldn't say accomplices because they're all in the, and, you know, mostly on the same page anyway. So. And, and is this the end of the right to assembly in Massachusetts? I mean, if, no. if you know, with two, you can only, only have... Only if you're a pro-life, everybody else can assemble. Labor activists, the Occupy movement, environmentalists, everybody else will still be able to engage in, uh, in behavior, even no matter how obnoxious it can be. Remember, uh, the Occupy movement took over an entire portion of Dewey Square and set up tents. They, uh, they literally occupied public property, and uh, nothing was done about it. And here, you know, uh, 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 pro-lifers uh, 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 get within a, a certain area, they're, uh, they're, they're pushed back. It's just, uh, it's entirely selective, it's entirely punitive, it's, it's entirely unfair. And of course, and again, and the narrative is that pro-lifers are dangerous, that pro-lifers somehow are engaged in intimidation and harassment, pro-lifers are violent, and it's all a lie. I mean, this is all, uh, th th this is a, uh, uh, you know, the, 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 this is something of, of an Orwellian character in terms of uh, its, its outrageous inversion of the truth. In fact, I have an article here written in the Globe by Joanna Weiss, Court is Naive on Buffer Zones. What do you make of that? Well, I mean, uh, here's a woman who said that, who, that, uh, who wrote the stereotypical pro-lifer 
foaming at the mouth and screaming slurs. Now, if she wrote that about any other group, first of all, they wouldn't print it, uh, but they'd fire her. It just, it's just its overt, raw bigotry. And uh, this is an example of what passes for, um, uh, uh, for uh, the conventional wisdom uh, uh, among uh, our uh, societal elites. It's, it's outrageous. Again, they, they've, they've spent years. Planned Parenthood has a vested financial interest in demonizing pro-lifers and, and, and coming up with this narrative. And uh, Bill, didn't you say the other day in, at, uh, uh, in your testimony they actually had a Planned Parenthood activist who admitted uh, sending in agents provocateur to uh, discredit well, pro-lifers? Well, she was not a Planned Parenthood activist. It was, uh, her name was Joan Appleton. She used to run a uh, registered nurse, uh, ran a clinic in Virginia abortion clinic uh, some years ago. And when there were uh, rescues and demonstrations there at the clinic, she had uh, standing by several pro-abortion activists and women who would come before the cameras who were there you know, covering the event for the, for the news and give their testimony to the, you know, that I was a patient, I tried to get in, they did this to me, and I was knocked down, I was called names and so on. And she came here up in, in 1998 or nine, whenever we had the uh, the hearings for the initial version of the buffer zone, and she testified. You know, uh, you know, once again to no avail. I mean, these, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, testimonies, these, you know, hearings before these committees, you know, somewhat remind me of, uh, you know, the show trials of the Soviet Union. You know, you bring in all these experts, and you bring in women who, you know, were going to the other. We had a woman yesterday who was there from Worcester, who was coming down the sidewalk, Chandler Street, and heading to Planned Parenthood in Worcester with an appointment for an abortion. She met a sidewalk counselor. She ended up changing her mind. She has a baby who's five years old now, and she's glad about it. Thanks, you know, the pro-lifers, was grateful for being well-treated by them and so forth. Uh, we have, you know, Rod Murphy there runs uh, Problem Pregnancy. Uh, the pregnancy counselors were there. We had sidewalk counselors telling about, you know, their story, you know, and, you know the, and what they know about women who had abortions. and. All this, you know, stuff, and we have, you know, as I mentioned to them, um, you know, the violence is really going, you know, towards us. And I said, and we can document that. We've had the people have assaulted us. We've taken to court. We prosecuted. So the, the pro aborts are really ass assaulting the pro lifers in reality. Is what's well, going well, on? Well, mostly it's uh, from two sources. It's you know, passersby who you know throw things out the window at you, or you know, swerve their car toward you, or somebody comes down the street and you know attacks a pro-lifer, or maybe there's a you know, boyfriend or something of a, someone going into the clinic. Um, it's pretty rare that you have somebody, you know, say works in the clinic, assault a pro-lifer, but that has happened. You know, we had that you know, security guard over in uh, uh, Brookline arrested and you know, ordered away from the clinic. He had to surrender his weapons. So you know, we can document the violence that's been done to us. And not only that, but you know, we successfully prosecuted it under existing law. We didn't have to go to the legislature and, you know, carve out some special, you know, pro-life rights bill or something. Um, and that's our contention here, is that if all these things that they claim are happening, you know, they should have, you know, hours of videotape that they can bring it. They haven't brought out one minute worth, you know, of all, and they have video cameras all around Planned Parenthood in Boston. They have it at the front door, they have it at the back door, they have up, you know, up on the height of the building on the four corners of the building. And how many times have you seen on the TV news or you look on YouTube or whatever, you'll see a video of you know some robbery or attempted robbery at a convenience store, gas station, shooting or whatever. You know, the security cameras pick it up and it's, you know, so if, if they have- It's on the evening this, news. You know, and the, and the assaults against us are relatively infrequent, but they're claiming that it's, you know, going on by the hour. Over there. In fact, you know, the buffer zone has only been, you know, defeated now. I think like two weeks, and the police have been out there every day. Um, and you know, we're supposed to believe that the police are either complicit or ignorant or blind or something. They have arrested nobody. They've threatened nobody with arrest. Um, there's no videotape of all this, you know, so outrageous behavior going on. And yet, that's the narrative they bring to the state house, and it's just presumed to be true. Um, and, and, and we, you know, and when they when they hear Eleanor McCullen testify, they say, well, you know, you're obviously a very sincere woman, you know, but the implication is you're you're the anomaly, you know. There's the other, you know, the bad actors who are there, you know. But it's That's you know, how the pro aborts try to portray it. Absolutely. I mean, but get, also if you how listen can they to they get the, away with unfounded claims and hysteria. Well, what, because what, they're what, they're why? singing the song of the you know, you have 
their counterparts in the legislature who and believe the, the same thing in the media. So yeah. they're they're all you know reciting the same creed. And but if you listen you know to the testimony of some of them, despite their claims that you know which you know, almost sounds ludicrous that well this this bill is not about abortion, you know it's about public safety. But you listen to many of the uh, testimonies by the the pro-abortion people. It's you know they talk about you know, one talked about feeling this dreadful uh, sense of uh, in, you know being sickened or uh, traumatized or something by this old man coming down the sidewalk. It was a Good Friday and they brought this wooden cross. They were having stations of the cross over there, or they don't. They one of them commented derisively about the professionally made signs that showed a portrait of a, uh, a young child and said, I was conceived in rape and on the sign, I do not deserve to die. You know, a perfectly legitimate pro-life uh, slogan, if you will. Um, <clears throat> or other signs that show, and if it's a sign with an aborted baby, well then that's characterized as a fake picture. So, you know, over and over again, any, there's, no, there's no good uh, pro-life uh, argument, picture, slogan, data, anything and everything that according we According to the pro According, according to them, everything yeah. According is to them. It's put in the most pejorative light. And so therefore, it becomes part and parcel of our criminal behavior because any utterance we could make, you know, constitutes, in their view, harassment, intimidation, uh, you're making me feel bad. It never, you know, the feeling bad on the part of anybody um, on the other side or any client or anything is never assigned to the uh, dreadful and traumatizing act of abortion itself, despite women's own testimony after the fact who've had abortions, um, it's all attributed only to the pro-lifers. So the pro-lifers are the problem, the villain, and must be eliminated by whatever means so, are at our disposal. So now Deval Patrick has been pushing this big time. Mm -hmm. He's our current governor, and uh, he used to sit on the board of Planned Parenthood uh, yeah. 10 or 12 years mm -hmm. ago. Yeah. Isn't that, shouldn't that be for, uh, shouldn't the public know about that? Yeah. And Martha well, Copley is fanatical. About but unfortunately the public doesn't care much. Yeah. And, and that's, the, that's the real root of your problem. Let me ask you this, CJ. Does the public know that Martha Marty Walls, the former state rep from the Beacon Hill area, drafted the former 35-foot buffer zone? And now she's working and making a quarter million dollars at Planned Parenthood? Yeah, uh, uh, they certainly have far more resources than the, the pro-life movement has. Mm -hmm. we, we should mention, Brendan, by the way, to your viewers, uh, that this is being rushed through the legislature so quickly that this could actually be passed by the time you see the show. But if it has not been passed, it's still very, very important that you call your state representative and speak out against this, uh, the, 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 this dreadfully punitive unfair, unwarranted, misdirected piece of legislation. And if you go to our website, thecatholicactionleague.org, you can get links uh, to the telephone numbers of both House members and of Senate members. So again, it's catholicactionleague.org. I should also point out exactly what's going on here in terms of abuse of process. This bill, um, this new, which is basically the third buffer zone bill in 15 years, this bill, by the way, you would think a 9-0 to zero Supreme Court <laughs> decision would have a chastening effect on the Massachusetts political class, but that, that's obviously an unreasonable assumption here. This bill was filed late in the day on the 14th of July, Monday. Uh, the text of it wasn't available until uh, until Tuesday publicly on the uh, the 15th of July. Then a public hearing was held on Wednesday, the 16th of July, and uh, apparently, uh, the, what, before the scheduled end of the of the public to go to 6 p.m. They had managed to report it out of two committees favorably, run it through three readings in the Senate, and have it passed to be engrossed by the Massachusetts Senate. Uh, now, this really is something that, the, uh, that even the old Supreme Soviet would be reluctant to, to act in this way. This is absolutely an abuse of the democratic process. It's an abuse of the Constitution. It's, a, it's abuse of the, of the rules of the, uh, of the House and the Senate. So that you should also uh, be upset not only over the content of this bill, but the manner in which it's being stampeded, railroaded, and rushed through. And you should let, let your state representative know that this is uh, you're, you're outraged by this. Mm -hmm. And by the way, they also have, in addition to uh, our website that has the link for their individual phone numbers and for their, uh, uh, their email addresses, you also have uh, the main phone number of the House of Representatives, which is 617-722-2000, 617-722-2000. Call them and, uh, and ask to speak to your state representative and tell them you're outraged by the content of this bill, which is, again, entirely misdirected. It's pro-lifers who are the victims here. And I think, as Bill has pointed out in the past, they were the ones that the Supreme Court found were deprived of their rights. Instead of being treated 
treated as victims, they're being treated as aggressors. Uh, <laughs> this is a case of, uh, of really, again, an Orwellian inversion of reality uh, based upon uh, the, uh, the interests, the financial and the ideological interests of the abortion industry, which apparently has completely captured our, uh, our, uh, our elected representatives. So it's, uh, it's very, very sad. But both the content of the bill is, is objectionable and the whole process by which, again, it's being uh, stampeded through is something that, uh, well, where are the good government groups, by the way? Where's Common Cause and all these other groups that normally speak out against uh, 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 any kind of abuse or unethical behavior or, or improper behavior in terms of the democratic process? Why aren't they speaking out about, imagine a bill within a few hours goes from a public hearing to two committee reports, three readings, and passage by one of the two branches. It's outrageous. Now you, it's, you, it's, it's, well, you know, Massachusetts may be part of the United States legally, but politically we're a third world country. Now you had spent time in early in your yeah. career working on Beacon Hill, yeah. didn't you? Yeah, I, I never. I mean, I, I have no illusions about how bad they can be at times. But this is really a new depth. This is really a new low. I, I've never seen anything like this before. Now um, I know that uh, Jim Lyons and some others actually tried to. I think Mark Lombardo tried to pass or get some type of uh, legislation or talk about chastening of this Marty Walls. That you know, here she is. She was the author of the. 35-foot buffer zone that mm -hmm. has been voted out by the Supreme Court, right. and she's now profiting in the abortion industry. Can't, can't we do something about that as citizens? I mean, isn't there a law that... Uh, Chapter 268 of the General Laws of the Commonwealth says you can't act as an agent for someone other than the Commonwealth. So I suppose, but that would be up to the State Ethics Commission uh, or the Attorney General's Office, so, and both of whom are, are uh, probably ideologically far more in tune with uh, Marty Waltz than, uh, than uh, the other side. You yeah, know, the so. Ethics Committee uh, that uh, Jim and uh, Mr. Lombardo uh, uh, submitted that uh, uh, observation to and, and uh, rejected it. So nothing will be done. Is, is this, uh, let, well, first of all, Martha Coakley, is, is she doing this for gubernatorial reasons because she's running for governor uh, in a few months or she's well, running now? I suppose really? in her mind it doesn't hurt. Yeah. It's to save face from that uh, drubbing that she took of nine to zero? Well, I, I think also she has a history of being extremely fanatical on this issue. So, I mean, mm -hmm. I, I uh, you know, it would be normal to ascribe political motives to a person in Massachusetts politics, but in this case, I think uh, it isn't just political with Martha Coakley. I think she's, uh, she's heavily, heavily invested on one side in this issue, and mm -hmm. uh, it seems to be quite personal. Remember, she actually said, uh, let's not get mad, let's get even. And if you look at these draconian penalties, including a $10,000 civil penalty for the first offense, uh, that's certainly getting even. The question is, who is she getting even with? Eleanor McCullen? I mean, my God, you know, uh, this is, uh, this woman is well, a fanatic when it comes to it. Remember, Martha Coakley also said a year ago, when we talked about conscience clauses, for people who are pro-life, he said. She said, "If you're Catholic or pro-life, you really shouldn't work in a hospital emergency room." So this is not someone that has a, 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 a deep commitment to the uh, constitutional right to uh, freedom of speech or freedom of religion. Can I ask you? Is this, do you think that this legislation is more unconstitutional than what the Supreme Court just struck down nine to zero? Well, I don't know how you can be more unconstitutional, um, but. Uh, you know, I mean, the other one was an absolute uh, ban that applied to everybody. This one is a, you know, an ad hoc ban that applies temporarily to people selected by a given policeman. So, you know, on the face of it, it would seem to be, uh, you know, something that would be at least probably not as frequently in effect, you know, not usually in effect in the sense that most of the time, hopefully, we're not going to be banished behind the line. But uh, so I guess the answer is no to your question. But that you know, it's still not acceptable. We should also point out that we, we owe this in some way to Chief Justice Roberts, who could have gone with the four justices who said this was unconstitutional root and branch, and instead uh, went with the four more liberal justices who said that um, it wasn't narrowly tailored enough. So this, of course, gave the opening for them to come back with another piece of legislation. So uh, thank you again, Chief Justice Roberts, for this. Mm -hmm. Well. Uh, We've kind of come to the end of our show here. Uh, I mean, I, I tell just them to call the legislature again. Then call Brendan. the legislature. We get that number up on the screen. As I, I let you know, folks, that I hope you found today's show to be the unfettered truth, uh, and moreover, that it compels you to take action to call these legislatures 
not to vote for the bill number. Uh, it's um, it's the uh, what's the bill number? My God, uh, 2281, I think. 2281. Senate, Senate 28 opposed Senate 2281. The new buffer zone law. Main number of the House 617-722-2000. 617-722-2000. Or go to the CatholicActionLeague.org website and get the link to the phone numbers and email addresses of your of your state rep. Well, thank you, Bill, for coming in, and CJ for coming all the way from uh, where you live here. And thank you, uh, Brendan. Locally. <laughs> and thanks for watching, folks. We hope you found today's show to be unique, informative, content-rich, truthful, and thought-provoking. We'll see you next week. Welcome to Life Matters. I'm your host, Brendan O'Connell. Well, today's guest is a mother of four children and founder and director of Northern Ireland's leading pro-life group. In 1997, she founded Precious Life after viewing a picture of a baby killed by abortion. Well, welcome, Mrs. Bernadette Smith. Thank you, Brendan. I'm delighted to speak to you from Ireland. Okay. Um, as a voice for the unborn child, and I know many of the, the listeners will be in agreement that this is a worldwide struggle and we have to unite. And I'm here to tell you about the, um, the threat to Ireland to legalize abortion. Well, Bernadette, can you give us a little bit of the history between Ireland, England, Northern Ireland? What's gone on and what are some significant... Hello, welcome to Life Matters. I'm your host, Brendan O'Connell. Well, one of the true icons of the pro-life movement, uh, Miss Nellie Gray, passed away in 2012. And uh, they searched around for a, uh, someone who could fill her shoes, and we think we found that person. Her name is Jeannie Monaghan. Well, welcome, Jeannie. Oh, thanks for having me. Jeannie, could you please uh, speak first to the, uh, the legacy that Nellie Gray left regarding the... Uh, Right to Life movement and the March for Life, which is uh, really an enormous event down in Washington, D.C. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, I mean, on that, just on your final note there, uh, the March for Life is the largest pro-life event in the world that we know of, and we think it's the largest civil rights. Well, welcome, Mr. James Sedlak. Well, Brendan, it's great to be here. Thank you for having me on. Mr. Sedlak, uh, could you give your assessment of the most recent Planned Parenthood annual report that came out oh, a week or two ago? Absolutely. And what this report shows, the one that came out last week, um, is that in 2011, 2012, Planned Parenthood had a total income of $1.2 billion. I'll, I'll repeat that again. That's $1.2 billion billion with a B. Mm -hmm.